Hey everybody, I'm gonna try this out here. Try to do an actual lecture. So let me know how it goes. I've got my camera pointed here where you can. I've got my tablet pulled up. These are the the slides that I would normally use to do this lecture. I'll put these out on Canvas so you've got access to them. Uh, I'll move this. This is just on my tablet so I can move it back and forth. I've got paper here to represent the whiteboard. Let's just see how we do, okay? So this will be the first page. Um, <clears throat> let's just look. There's, I've got, for the most part today, a lot of this is just going to be on kind of some PowerPoint slides. So <clears throat> make sure the glare is not too bad there. That's not too bad. Uh, you can see. For the first two exams in this class, we focused on the first law, conservation of energy principle. For this portion of the course, we're going to talk about, start introducing the concept of the second law. Now, in the textbook that we're using, Changle and Bowles, they, uh, they have this chapter six, and that's really what we're going to focus on today, is starting chapter six. And I always like to say chapter six is Chapter 6 is this intro to the second law. And in fact, they I don't even know if they ever actually show you the second law in Chapter 6. I think they just kind of uh, say, here's how we got to the second law. And... <clears throat> And that's fine, and, and you'll see a, a chapter like that in most thermo books where uh, they never actually show you the second law. They just talk about how did we arrive at the second law. Now, what you have to understand is all of this, the idea of thermodynamics arrives in, in science around the time of the Industrial Revolution where we're really trying to figure out how do we get the most energy out of these steam engines. We've got this cool device that I can provide a heat source uh, and it generates power that we can use then to power our, our textile mills, our flour mills, whatever it is that we need to, to power. I mean, we don't have to be right next to a lake or a river. We just have this power source. Anywhere I can get a fuel source to it, I now have power and readily available. And, uh, and that's kind of our goal is to get as much of that power or as much of that heat Converted into power, right? and that's um, chapter six. Kind of takes us on this exploration of how did we get to where we figured out what is the limit, because right? we had to figure out what is the limit. How much of that heat can we turn into power? So, if we think about first law, conservation of energy principle, and we say up to this point, um, that's really what we looked at. But there are many processes that we could suggest, and I would. I would suggest these don't actually exist. There's no processes that are going to violate the second law. Um, we know, or at least we could propose situations where um, it's possible according to conservation of energy, but we know it's not going to happen, at least not spontaneously. One of my favorite examples is let's say that I uh, put a can of Coke, uh, it's Coca-Cola, I grew up in, in central Oklahoma, so everything to me is a can of Coke. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter whether it's Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, Sprite, it's, it's all Coke. Well, what flavor of Coke would you like? Uh, you go to my parents' house and they say, well, you want a Coke? Yeah. All right. What flavor do you want? Dr. Pepper will be just fine. All right. And, and <laughs> so anyway, so it's a can of Coke. Let's say I take a can of Coke, I put it out on the coffee table, and let's say the can of Coke is cooler, slightly cooler than the atmosphere when we start. We set it on the coffee table and it spontaneously cools down 10 degrees. That'd be really cool. Think about that, right? Get your favorite beverage out of its case, put it on the coffee table, and it spontaneously gets cooler. Now here's the neat thing. If we think about that, just from a conservation of energy standpoint, Just from a conservation of energy standpoint, first law, to write a first law equation, we say what crosses the boundary? Well, the only thing crossing the boundary, of course, is heat. 
So if we say, well, minus the heat out, can stationary, so the only change in energy is going to be the internal. So as long as can of coke is about 12 fluid ounces, give or take, that's about three quarters of a pound in English units. Right, and instead of delta U, let's say M P sub P because it's liquid. T two minus T one. Now coke is essentially water. The specific heat of liquid water is essentially one BTU. Uh, it's BTU per pound mass. Rankin. You guys know how I write my units. They're there. They may not be pretty, but they're there. And let's say it's going to lose 10 degrees Rankin. It's going to lose 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 degrees Rankin. So you can see what happens. The, the first law says as long as the heat loss by this can is 7.5 BTUs. Go for it. No problem. First law says that's possible. Now, as we know, as we just said, there are processes we could propose that may behave under the first law, but then we know they're not possible. And how we know they're not possible is they do not behave according to the second law. So it's pretty easy to, to obey the first law. It's a little harder to stay within the second law when we start proposing these really cool processes. Let's talk about how we know that. Well, chapter six again, Intro to the Second Law talks about how did we arrive at the conclusion that is the Second Law. Well, there's a number of people that were working at this time to try to figure out how can we get the most heat out of these steam engines. Our good friend Clausus is one of them. Uh, in your text, and again, direct quotes, so it's a quotation from Changel and Bowles. They say the Clausus statement is, it is impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycle. Granted, this is not a cycle, but it operates, uh, operates in a cycle and produces no effect other than transfer of heat from a lower temperature body to a higher temperature body. There has to be something else occur. I mean, it's, it's possible to cool something down. We know that. But that can't be the only thing. Now, this also has a couple of other implications. Right? Um, you can't simply transfer heat from a low, body, low temperature body to a higher temperature body. And that has implications in what we can and can't do for refrigeration. Now, another statement that was um, instrumental in the development of the second law was what we call the Kelvin-Planck statement. And, and typically, we, we credit this to both Kelvin and Planck, who are, from my understanding, now, I'm sure I'm going to get ridiculous comments in there, and I, I'm not a history person, right? and I've not gone and verified this, but to my understanding, um, both Kelvin and Planck were working independently and essentially came to the same conclusion, so we credit both of them with this idea. And they came to the conclusion that it is impossible to, for a device to operate in a cycle, receive heat from a single reservoir, and produce a net amount of work. Right. Now, this has a number of implications, especially when we get into steam engines. And what one implication from that is we can't simply take steam that we run through a turbine, reheat it, um, and then run it back to the turbine. Now, there's some reasons we could talk about. We've got to increase the pressure. Uh, we've got to. Um, I mean, you can. You can take the steam right out of the turbine, heat it right back up run it back through. Um, it's not going to last very long. You're eventually going to expand to the point where you can't expand it anymore. There's That can't be the only thing you do. Right? But again, there's this other term in here, cycle. You can't have a device operating in a cycle that does this. We're going to talk about some basic cycles here uh, in the next few videos. It's going to be kind of our goal. Let's continue on. Let's talk about, and this is kind of difficult to show without actually understanding entropy. Um, we could draw a PV diagram and, and show you why this is the case, but let's just keep going, okay? 
So what we would like to do is we'd like to get to a point where we can quantify how, how, how do we know this? How, how, or what is the limit? Um, so again, the second law is really formed on the basis of both the Klaus's statement and the Kelvin Planck statement. But those, it's kind of difficult to measure those. Those are just statements. That's where the second law comes in. Eventually we come to the conclusion and the realization that the second law is dealing with another quantity. That quantity we call entropy. Right? And, and essentially the conclusion comes up that um, as long as there's more entropy, as long as the there's more entropy than we started with, then no matter what we do, that, then that's fine. As long as we have either the same amount or more entropy, that is greater than or equal to. The second law is an inequality. It's not an equation like the first law where we're conserving energy. The second law is essentially saying we're generating entropy. Okay, now, don't worry too much about this. In the next chapter, for us, that's chapter 7, we're going to talk about entropy and quantifying it actually talk about using this law. Now for us, sorry, I'm going to check my time here and see how I'm doing. Okay, I'm okay. Um, for us, <clears throat> this is an intro to the second law. And so, I mean, again, I don't even think in your textbook in Chapter 6 they show you the second law. I like to at least show you and say, here's where we're headed. Let's talk about how do we get there. All right? So, in, in, but again, what the second law does is it helps us identify direction that energy can flow, especially heat. It really deals with heat. What direction can heat flow and how much can you push heat in the opposite direction? Uh, and again, it's an inequality. So it tells us that um, it, it sets a limit. Right? Everything is going to be this amount or less or this amount or more. Uh, it tells us we can't have anything more than 100%. Um, and in fact, most things are not even 100%. There's, there's much lower limits placed on us. And we quantify all this with a quantity, again, we call entropy. That's the capital F there. Now, again, intro to the second law. Let's worry about entropy soon. So before we get into trying to quantify entropy and the amount of entropy being generated for a process, let's look at how we got there. Let's look at some theory and some terms um, before, we, before we go that far. Okay. All right, so a term here, the term thermal energy reservoir, also sometimes called reservoir or thermal reservoir or heat reservoir. I, I normally just refer to it as a reservoir. A thermal energy reservoir, and again, direct quote from the Chengel and Bowles, te or, yeah, Chengel and Bowles text, uh, is a body that can supply or absorb finite amounts of heat without undergoing any change in temperature, at least no significant change in temperature. Now, any object that we add heat to or remove heat from is going to experience a temperature change. The question is, is it a significant temperature change? Can we, is, it, is it negligible? And so for us, a, a reservoir is any object that we can add heat to or remove heat from with, uh, with negligible effects. Typically, these are very large bodies, something like the atmosphere, maybe a lake, maybe a river. Um, so our system would be just a little speck right in, right in here somewhere. Not very, not very big, not very much. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we do have to be aware that no, no reservoir is infinite. doesn't matter whether it's our atmosphere, or a lake, or river. Uh, when we've got a hydroelectric dam, they have to mix the the fluids, they have to mix the liquid, the, the water, before they send it downstream. They can't just send cold water off the bottom of the lake downstream. It just destroys all the, the wildlife. And, and um, the same thing happens if we, there are limits. If we set a power plant next to a lake or a river, there's limits as to how much we can increase the temperature of the water that we put back into that body. Uh, that reservoir. Okay, so that's the idea here. So long as our system's small in comparison, and we don't put in an infinite amount of energy or remove an infinite amount of energy, then we can only do so sustainably. We just have to.